Coming out the Saturday on the other vibe, I'm joined by guitar virtuoso Philip Says. Anytime Jeff went into a venue, the band would basically stop playing and be like, Jeff's here, everybody, Jeff would have to sit in because you just, you want to hear him play. <laughs> and uh, so Jeff grabbed me and he said, uh, he, he goes, okay, Philip, you play guitar. He goes, I want to play bass. I'm like, what is happening right now? Went outside and he just said, hey, how would you like to join my band? And I, and I basically passed out. He just said, you know, we'll feature you every night. We'll let you front the band. You can sing a song or two and, wow. and we'll kind of groom you and we'll get you going, get you ready. And then we'll send you out on your own. How does that sound? Instead of going to, to university, hmm. uh, I went to the University of Jeff Healy for four years. And, uh, and he really kicked my ass every night. His name is Phil Sace. Make him feel welcome, will you? This became such a personal album because I didn't know, again, it was like a diary. I didn't know if it would, any of these songs would ever have the opportunity to be released. Um, that just came very naturally, the song Backstabber. And the lyrics of the song, the actual the theme, and actually sonically the way it sounds, really represents some of my experiences in the music business. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's an incredible. That's a great question. So I am going to, my brain is completely melting right now. I'm, I'm shutting. <laughs> Everybody goes, oh my God. It looks good over there. I, yeah. I want to hang out at your place. <laughs> I, I have a party trick. I can do two angles. Well, That's my, man. my little thing. <laughs> I could I could barely get the link working, you know. So it looks. <laughs> so I'm here with uh, Philip Sace. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Of course, you know you have this new album on the way. Uh, the Wolves are coming, coming out on the 23rd of February, um, which we'll absolutely be diving into. Um, but first, you know, I like to kind of take a look at how things all began because you know people look at you today as this kind of virtuoso guitarist, but everything oh. started somewhere. <laughs> um so how wow. did this kind of journey begin for you well that's a that's a pretty warm introduction thank you and uh <laughs> you know honestly i i really am a student of music and so uh you know i don't look at it any other way than that i'm just trying to learn and mm. uh i have the same excitement i did on the first day i picked up a guitar that i do today i have the same curiosity and uh hunger to uh to learn and to get better and to be more connected with myself through the mm. through the art of you know music through the the vehicle that music is um and approach it really as a student um always always striving to do better and uh not in a self-deprecating kind of way but just in the you know as i said just out of a, a curiosity of you know what can i what's in here today what can i connect with you know and um and hopefully receive and and try to follow in that way and and uh so that's that's been sort of my my approach with music the whole time i'm so grateful to have the opportunity to make music in my lifetime and you know just want to just want to stay connected to it i love it Hmm. Did you have kind of a moment when you were kind of growing up where it was like, you know, I want to be a musician and in particular, like a guitarist? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks for asking about that. You know, my mom and dad um, grew up in the UK and in London, really, and, and parts of the UK in the 60s. And so they came up hearing all of that great music, right? And that real sweet spot of of, uh, of history there with art and music and culture and in a lot of ways. And um, so that's the music that both my brother and I grew up with. That's what they listened to around the house. Um, and so we got to hear all the all that cool stuff, you know, um, all those great artists. And so um, of those artists, you know, a lot of times we were hearing people like 
Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck and Mark Knopfler. And um, obviously Mark Knopfler was, was a little bit later, but you know, these incredible artists um, from the UK, but also American artists, you know, my parents introduced me to people like Albert Collins and Stevie Ray Vaughan and um, uh, the list is long, you know, Ry Cooter. And so really, um, they took me to see Clapton play when I was a little kid. Uh, he played in Toronto where we grew up and um, Mark Knopfler was also in his band on that tour. And uh, I remember going to that show and Clapton walked out. It was when he was wearing the nice suits, kind of late, late eighties or whatever, you know, and hair slicked back and um, man, he just wailed that night. And it just kind of hit me. I had like a, I had a, I had a response at a cellular level. It was so deep and powerful. Um, and obviously Mark Knopfler being there too, was like a double whammy. And from that point on, you know, I, I was like, man, I really want to learn how to play. And, you know, we had, as I mentioned about Stevie Ray Vaughan, there was such an admiration for Stevie at home too. And my, my dad would play his music. And when he passed, it was such a, it was such a big, big deal for us. It was, you know, very upsetting and, and mm. really opened my heart and my mind. And I decided that I wanted to, uh, to really dedicate my life to this music that I'd grown up listening to. And, and it's still the music I listen to today. And I think really trying to do it through my own lens, do it through my own experience, but also do my very best to remind people where the music comes from. And, you know, so if we get a chance to talk about Magic Sam, let's talk about him. Let's talk about Freddie King. Let's talk about T-Bone Walker. Let's talk about, you know, the, the lineage of where this music comes from and shine a light in that way. Um, in the way that someone like Stevie Ray Vaughan did, I think better than, than anyone. He shone a light on all of his influences. So, mm. um, I had read that, uh, you know, in your kind of your breakthrough when, when uh, Jeff Healy kind of caught you playing a, a gig at Toronto and within that year you, you went on and, and kind of toured with him. Um, how did that kind of conversation come about? I mean, that seems like a, a by chance thing, you know, goes to a gig and then sees you there. You know what? So it was, so Jeff is at the time as well. And now is, you know, of my uh, desert Island favorite mm -hmm. musicians ever. And one of my biggest influences. And uh, at the time I had started going out, you know, I was about 18 or so 19. I was just kind of, you know, getting out on the scene in Toronto and, and, and playing shows. And I started recording an album and signed a, a record deal and was kind of getting going and, a friend of mine um, named Corey, um, he was uh, good friends with Jeff. And we had met uh, at some shows and he's a real wizard guitar player and aficionado about tone. And and we really bonded over vintage wah-wah pedals. <laughs> and uh, he knew that I was deeply influenced by Jeff. He came and saw a show and was like, oh yeah, yeah I, you like Jeff, don't you? And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, Jeff also being from Toronto, uh, Corey said to me, uh, well, I know Jeff well. And um, Corey used to take Jeff Healy around to some clubs. He actually um, was instrumental in getting Jeff to sit in with Stevie Ray Vaughan and Albert Collins. And so he, you know, he was really tight with Jeff. And my understanding is that he said, hey, I met this guy who's just getting started. And man, you know, I think you should check him out. And so uh, anyway, our Jeff and, and my paths crossed a couple of times and um he came to a show one night i didn't know he was there uh, but people told me after jeff was here and i was like oh shit <laughs> jeff was here you know this is like you know i was freaked out and uh, i was like man i hope it was a good show you know and then uh jeff and i ran into each other uh in an area of toronto called kensington market now i know there's a kensington market in, in london as well but um in toronto there's a kensington market and um we both went into this club together. There's a band playing. And anytime Jeff went into a venue, the band would basically stop playing and be like, Jeff's here. Everybody, Jeff would have to sit in because you just, you want to hear him play. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Jeff grabbed me and he said, uh, he, he goes, can Philip, you play guitar. He goes, I want to play bass. I'm like, what is happening right now? So Jeff played bass and I played guitar and sang. And I think he was just kind of, He's going to see like, how, let's see how this is going to go. Let's see what's going on here. And um, so we played a couple of, um, you know, a couple of songs like Spoonful and, you know, like uh, some Crossroads and things like uh, Robert Johnson, Willie Dixon and Howlin' Wolf type songs. 
cream influence, you know, and, and we, we left the, the club and went outside and he just said, Hey, how would you like to join my band? And I, and I basically passed out. And when I, <laughs> when I woke up, um, you know, I was sort of pinching myself. And he just said, listen, we'll, uh, you know, what we'll do is we'll, we'll teach you how to play on big stages. You know, we'll, we're going to, cause they're touring the world and we're playing all these, they're, they're playing all these amazing festivals and venues. And he just said, you know, we'll feature you every night. We'll let you front the band. You can sing a song or two and, wow. and we'll kind of groom you and we'll get you going, get you ready. And then we'll send you out on your own. How does that sound? And I'm like, what? You know, so it was, <laughs> and he was a man of his word all the way through, you know? Um, so coming out of high school, instead of going to, um, to university, hmm. uh, I went to the university of Jeff Healy for four years and, uh, and he really kicked my ass every night for four years. <laughs> I got to see how, how, how it's really done. Cause he was, uh, truly, uh, in the very, very top percentage, uh, of any musician I've ever seen anywhere, anytime. He was a magnificent light. Mm. Um, of course, you know, you have this new album, The Walls Are Coming. Uh, it's been a few years uh, since the, the last release, Spirit Rising. But did you have kind of a, did you want to go in with a different approach this time around? You know, look uh, with a different kind of mindset, maybe? Yeah, you know, thanks for asking. It was a different mindset. Um, the last six, seven years, I've been signed to Warner Music. And so uh, working in that area for um you know for the for the previous couple of re releases including spirit rising and um, working with a team there was a great learning experience um and uh, sort of you know navigating all of those opportunities the um challenges but also the benefits um and when the pandemic hit and kind of wiped the slate clean um you know the spirit rising came out during the pandemic and we had been gearing up for that release uh for really a couple of years leading up to that um and so it was really out of everyone's control um and when the dust settled things looked real different um and this was an opportunity for me to really step out on my own and to honor my own intuition as opposed to working within um you know, just, just, it gave me an opportunity to start my own label um, and to really find what was going on deep inside myself um, and not really sure if any of the music was going to ever be released for The Wolves Are Coming. It was really, like, what am I going to do for the next year? I don't know. Well, I'm going to sit in this room and I'm going to practice for hours a day and sing for hours a day and write for hours a day and just try to work on my craft and try to become better that um as an artist and out of that a lot of soul searching came came these songs some of them had been sort of starts things that i'd forgotten about and didn't have an opportunity to look at for a while and um and some of them were brand new uh written about things that i was looking at going on around me here in the world and um so it's, it was really a uh, total freedom and um just an exp this uh, a kind of lonely experience as well. I wasn't bouncing ideas off anyone. It wasn't really the same kind of collaboration when you're working with a label or an A&R team or, you know, it was, it was very different. And uh, I really like it. You know, I'm not an artist that really needs to be micromanaged. Um, and I think I learned that from working with Jeff Healy and also working with Melissa Etheridge for four years. These are the kinds of um, mentors that I had that, they're very focused. They don't need someone to come in and tell, hold their hand in the studio or hold their hand when they're writing or really tell them to be something other than, than they are. And Jeff and Melissa both told me that they said, you know, you were very clear on who you are. You know, you don't need anybody to try to tell you to fit into a box. And sometimes when you're that kind of an artist, it can be very lonely because you're sort of out in front in a way there's not, you know, a, a lot of times, in this business, um, they're looking for malleable people. And that's not bad. I, I'm totally open to collaboration and constructive feedback and all that. As I said, I want to learn all the time. Mm -hmm. But this became such a personal album because I didn't know, again, it was like a diary. I didn't know if it would, any of these songs would ever have the opportunity to be released. It was totally self-funded. So it really made it on a shoestring budget. Um, and, you know, I, I think it turned out 
uh, better than I could have ever imagined. I think it was just totally honest and um, really doing it in a way where I didn't really care if anybody heard it or not. This is what it is. It is this is how I'm feeling. Mm. Um, of course, you know, it's full of those kind of uh, recognizable Philip Sace riffs in there. Um, you know, great example being uh, Bitches Brew and, and your, your new uh-huh. one, uh, Backstabber. Um, could, you, could you talk a bit about those two songs, you know, how they came about? I mean, obviously you said there it's kind of more on you these days, kind of making these decisions. Yeah, well, you know, um, Backstabber was a song that, uh, you know, it was like those kind of big, heavy, kind of grungy riffs like that, you know, big sort of, you know, kind of get your head moving like that. I mean, those are my favorite kind of kind of songs. So when I listen to other artists or other bands, uh, that's what it really gets me excited so um that just came very naturally the song backstabber and the lyrics of the song the actual the theme and actually sonically the way it sounds really represents some of my experiences in the music business uh Mm -hmm. over many years and really that it's a jungle out there um it is uh totally unscrupulous ruthless business and i think the song really uh, captures um what it feels like when people will be stabbing you in the back like that and uh you know people who pretend to be your friend and uh and then you know come at you find out personal information and come at you you know things like that uh sometimes in business sometimes uh even in personal things so the song really sums that up and uh, was a real great outlet for me to to really release some of the frustrations uh and hurt ways that I've been really hurt many times in this business over and over again. And um, so it's been a real, uh, it's been kind of exciting to, to hear that song released. And I think to see it resonating with people, because I think a lot of people feel that way. I think yes. a lot of people, you know, I found it um, quite relatable. Interesting. So tell me, yeah. can you say more? Can you tell me more? I'm, I'm curious. Like they like just, it, it was, it was one of the, it's kind of like almost cathartic. Because it's like, like, like I'm I'm listening to this song and I'm like I'm feeling the I don't know I'm feeling similar feelings you know like obviously you have your experiences I have mine and I'm like oh I don't know there's something here that resonates with me you know it's similar kind of industry it's you know what I mean like you you get that and like um, obviously it's a catchy song it's a great song but yeah you know you, you get those feelings and I I just think that it's a a great relatable song. I think a lot of people will feel the same. Um, well, I, thank you for sharing a little bit. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the hurt that you've experienced on your journey. And I think, you know, what comes up for me is that, you know, I, the intention of the song is really also to let you know, and to maybe let me know, and maybe anybody else that resonates with that, you know, we're not alone when we feel yes. that way. I think, you know, when, when we do experience betrayal, um, or uh, viol- were violated in some kind of way, it can be really draining. It can be, re- you know, and it's hard to process that. It's mm. hard to know what to do with it. And so sometimes I think the best thing to do is to to connect with others and, and know that we're not alone in feeling that. And, hey, you know, hey, my, you know, my, this person feels that way too. They have, oh, you had something happen? Oh my gosh, tell me about it. And then mm. we can kind of meet there and maybe maybe find a find some space for some healing. Right. Release it, you know. Release yes. that shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there? A, do, do you have a kind of a process when you're coming up with these riffs? I mean, obviously, bitches brew that that first track out the gate. You know, it's a very catchy song. Um, cool. Do you kind of does it? Is it born out of improv that kind of stuff or? Yeah, thanks for thanks for asking about that song. So yeah, the the oh that bitches brew was really um, about a, about an experience I had at a party where somebody gave me something that um, was a drink. It was called the bitches brew, and it right. totally totally knocked me out for a long time. I was really sick from it, and the, you know, so the song itself, though the music part of it did come out of you know just being here at home in this room writing. And a lot of times I'll be, you know, playing something and a riff will pop up and I'll go, oh, that that could work. And I'll just kind of hang out with it. And sometimes I'll write it out for a half an hour and it'll turn to a song. Other times I'll just put it into my phone and kind of come back to it later. And that song just kind of wrote itself in about 10 minutes. 
and the theme for it as I was like, well, what am I going to say about this song? And then just, oh, remember that time you had that drink and got sick? Oh, and it just kind of, it just kind of came together. And it was, you know, really, it was such a psychedelic um, experience that I couldn't help but kind of, you know, nod a little bit to the, to the Helen Wolf type, uh, the influence um, via, Led Zeppelin, you know, obviously taking a little bit of that. I hear a lot of bands really tipping their hats to Led Zeppelin. And I thought I'm going to get a little bit of my own too. So, you know, we, uh, we had fun, but, but certainly being mindful of where that comes from. I said, Helen Wolf and, and Willie Dixon, other great artists where that type of riff and that kind of influence is really where that comes from. Mm. Um, the, pro- the production aspect of it, certainly from some of the great records of the late sixties including Led Zeppelin and Hendrix, for sure. Um, of course, you know, you have these uh, signature strats, one of them there being, I believe that, is that the mother? That one? Yeah, this, yeah. this is the mother um, strat. Yeah, the I'm mother right strat. There. And then the uh, the sunburst as well. Is is there, uh, was, was, is there, is it like a, a reason for you, for you p- picking those guitars in particular? You know, is is what's the reason behind that being kind of, well, those two being the choices for you? You know, I think when a guitarist is picking a guitar, it's like you're the extension of yourself at that point, isn't it? It re- that's you know what you're absolutely right. It sure is, and um, you know some guitars, it's like you just you play them, and it's like man, it's a really cool guitar, but I don't know that it's not the right one. And other times you play one and you can't put it down. And and for me, I'm really thankful to have found this amazing guitar and also the the other. Uh, old Fender that you mentioned, the old Strat, and they're both 63 Stratocasters. Um, and, uh, this, this one I've had for a long time. I saved up while I was working with Jeff Healy and, um, on the road, we were touring a lot and I was able to to purchase this and it came to me through a, a really good friend of mine named Bob, um, in Toronto. He, knew somebody out on the, I think it was Vancouver Island that was selling it. And it was, he was like, Oh, I hear it's a really good one. I hear that. I hear that this has like been their number one guitar. It's a good one. I'm like, cool. Well, sign me up. And I remember the UPS truck pulling up outside and the guy, you know, we came in a flight case and I it was all in slow motion. You know, I was like looking out the window, waiting for it, you know, Oh, is it, is it here? Where is it? You know? And then finally, and then, dropped it off and I opened it up and then, you know, the angels were singing and then I started playing it. I was like, Oh boy, this is beautiful. And it, it really immediately, you know, I had to, we got, we bonded and, and, you know, really I've been playing this guitar a lot ever, ever since. And, um, and I'm really thankful for it and, and, um, look forward to many more adventures together. And the, um, it's a similar, I have similar stories with a couple of the other vintage guitars that I have. I'm, I'm by no means a, a, a collector. I have a, a few guitars that I love, cherish, and play all the time, you know. Um, and uh, and I'm really thankful to have them. Mm. Do, you, do you have like a, maybe a dream piece that you'd, you'd hope to acquire? I don't know, like some, maybe uh, from somebody that you admire or something like, if, maybe a guitar or a pedal. Is is there something that, you know, if you had infinite funds, <laughs> you, you think, you know what, I'm going to get such and such. Yeah, I love that question. That is so cool. You know, so if we're in the, if we're in the fantasy zone right here, <laughs> you know, I would really love to own a Wawa pedal that was owned by Stevie Ray Vaughan. Mm. Uh, or and and i'm not gonna say or and uh a piece of uh, of something like that whether it be a a wawa pedal fuzz or an amp that was uh owned by Jimi hendrix i think would be uh, a real privilege um i think those are the the two players when i think about tone and and uh the depth of sound um really are my favorite you know, tones also along with Freddie King and, and Albert Collins. Um, so maybe something owned by um, those players um, just so I could sit there and stare at it, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but I think, I think really, you know, something like that, maybe a really beautiful wah wah pedal that, that I knew that Stevie Ray Vaughan used or, or, uh, or Jimi Hendrix. Mm. Is there a particular yeah. reason that you go for kind of these old school guitars? You know, obviously that 63 there. I mean, I think kind of non-guitarists, we, we always wonder kind of why why old school? Is it just the history that you, you kind of like? 
Yeah, I think I think there are a couple of things. I think that there is, um, you know, the excitement of like, well, you know, so so and so played vintage strats, like Clapton played old strats, and Stevie Ray played the old strats, and so, and you know, that's the that's the way you got to go to get that sound. And there really is when you get an old special one. You know, in the same way with a, you know, very much like a string instrument, a classical, like whether it's a violin or a cello, the, the sound when they're on point of an old one is just, it hasn't been recreated. Um, as far as I'm concerned, when you plug in a really a guitar that has it all going on like that, that was built 50, 60 years ago, um, there is just something for me personally that happens in the way I respond to the playing, to the sound, to to the. There's something. There's. It's just. It's. It's. I, it's almost like I can't put a word on it. it there is a different experience. Um, that being said, I've also played vintage guitars that I. You know, you don't necessarily have that experience. You're like, yeah, mm. that's okay. You know, but when you get one that is really humming. It just does things that uh, you can't plan for. It's not. Uh, it's not built with lasers. It's not built with a computer. It was mm -hmm. built in a way where maybe someone was smoking a cigarette while they were were uh, you know winding these pickups, and they went, "Oh, I gotta go. You know, I'm gonna have a coffee." And uh, oh, wait, I forgot I was winding a pickup, and they didn't pay attention. And then, but for whatever reason, that pickup sounds glorious, as opposed to having like a you know, uh, well, this much times this much for this long at this temperature. I don't know. I did, it didn't work like that. It was just, you know, simple magic happened, wasn't being overthought. And um, and maybe it's a combination too. Maybe older wood is drier. I mean, there's people have a million and one different theories why mm -hmm. certain old guitars uh, sing in the way they do. Um, but I know, I know for me, like when I've blown out pickups, old pickups on a guitar and I'll put in a new one, well, they sound good, it's, but it's not the same. There's mm -hmm. something wild that happened with that old stuff. And um, and again, not always, but sometimes. So that's that's really what I look for. And I'm thankful to say that I have uh, a, a couple of three uh, 60s guitars that are um, that really have something going on. Every time I play them, I just I can't put them down. Mm. I, I just find it interesting. I mean, it was a while ago speaking with uh, Scott Holiday from Rival Sons, and yeah. um, and he he spoke about the the you know there's something about those kind of old school guitars. He was saying you know like oh with this one I have to kind of wrestle it, and it's like a bit of a a contest. <laughs> he was saying it's like it's the character, like you get more out of it, and I I just find that interesting. You know, a lot of kind of uh, great guitarists out there prefer to go for that. That's, you know, for those similar reasons. Um, it's just interesting. Um, I, I uh, agree. And, and I think also, you know, someone like Scott, who's a great player, and the way that he plays, he's very, you know, there's a lot of physicality in his playing. Mm. And it's very, uh, I, I hear a lot of uh, spontaneous things happening in his playing that aren't, you know, to me, don't sound necessarily planned out. He's in the moment. And I think, you know, which is, which is what makes him great to me. And I think... Um, you know, I think that's really what's exciting about these old instruments is that mm. there's just something about them. They're not they're not cookie cutter perfect. They're not, you know, they're uh, there's things about them that maybe wouldn't make it through the, the assembly line in 2024. Mm. You know, but that's the things that make it cool. And uh, and I think also you just got to listen for yourself. You know, um, it's just because it's 62 Strat doesn't mean it's going to be great or a 59 Les Paul, you know, it could be uh a boat anchor, you know, it's like, <laughs> but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta just find the one that, uh, that's great. And, and, and that being said, or great, great to the individual, that being said, um, I've started playing Paul Reed Smith guitars over the last year and I, they've cracked a code in some way better than, you know, the other companies. And, um, for me, as far as I'm concerned, and I think the silver sky is the model that I've been playing, which they built in, in, uh, uh, partnership, I believe, with John Mayer, and it's a great, great guitar. And it's never, it's not going to replace this guitar or the old, old guitars, but for a modern guitar mm. and what it does and the playability of it, the sound, the consistency, um, just they've got it going on. That Silver Sky is the shit. Mm. 
I mean, when when it comes to that kind of recording process for you, for your new album, did you did you think about that kind of old school approach? Obviously, you got an old school guitar. Um, did you think kind of in terms of recording it in in maybe an old kind of manner as well, or or was you going for like modern kind of uh, stuff there? Great question. You know, both are true. Um, it's great to have, to have some of the modern amenities like recording in Pro Tools and, you know, the ability to cut and paste things, chop things up. You know, um, I'm all about that. Embracing technology, mm-hmm. using the tool, but being the driver with it is is key, you know. Um, not letting the, the technology dictate what's happening necessarily, but using it as a tool to enhance Um and, you know, the approach to recording for me is all about the, the vintage style where recording live off the floor, letting instruments bleed into the mics, bleed into the drum mics. Um, and I think a lot of that approach is that's always been my approach, what I've enjoyed in, in the studio. And I learned a lot, um, certainly working with Dave Cobb as a producer, we worked together on three or four albums or more and, and really watching the way that he was just like, there were no rules, you know, it's like, let's just have fun with it. And um, I've been working with Mark Raines, uh, the, the engineer who I met working with Dave many years ago. Um, and uh, Mark and I continue to work together off and on for, you know, many years. And, um, you know, his approach, the vintage mics that he uses, his aesthetic, his, his willingness to try things that maybe in other cases would be like, well, you can't do that. That sounds, that's broken sounding, you know, and Mark would be like, not so fast, watch this. And you just, your mind's blown. So, you know, having the opportunity to work with such a gifted engineer as, as Mark Raines um, and, and sort of my preference for sort of sounds that are, you know, a little bit, uh, they don't need to be like, again, like lasers, like cookie cutter or, you know, perfect. And um, not that I'm against that. There's times when that is the right thing. But yeah, we really did approach it from um, a little bit raw, a little raw, a little ready. If something was set, if a microphone sound a little distorted, maybe that's okay. Let's leave that. You know, there's, there's kind of like a, I guess, you know, sometimes there's good, bad, and then there's bad bad so you know you got to try to ascertain which one but um but i think it's cool to have a lot of fun with old gear the same way that you take an old tube amp and turn it up until it sounds like it's about to explode that's sometimes where the best shit happens and so same in the studio just having fun and really uh choose your own adventure throw the rule book out Mm. I mean, it's the thing that I've found that's that's coming up more and more from artists. You know, they may maybe because we've gone so far with production now that it's almost I don't know inhuman at times. That digital kind of thing yeah. is too perfect. So yeah. like, like kind of the the perfection is now in the imperfections. Like if it's not quite right, maybe that's love- where the sweet spot is. <laughs> well said. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> What comes up, when you say that, what comes up for me as well is just, you know, I think that there's been so long now that for all, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but really music, at least over the last 20 years, everything has been auto-tuned, right? Vocals. Yeah. So we're used to hearing a vocal that has been totally tuned and it has a certain tone to it as well that changes when you use auto excuse me, auto-tune or whatever, you know, plugin you're using to tune a vocal. The vocal takes on a different character and that has become the norm. And so a lot of times when recording and you don't use auto-tune, it's like, what's wrong here? Why does this not sound right? And it's because we've been cheating using auto-tune. For- <laughs> but that is now the norm, you know? So it's a, it's an interesting, uh, the more that we use that, the more that our ears become tuned to hearing something that is relying on uh, on technology, which I don't know if that's good or bad, but I think it's just an observation for me. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I've kind of, I don't know, cause maybe because I listen to like old records and stuff, and then I'll go to a new kind of, a new album, and it's quite jarring. As you mentioned there, you know, everything's kind of really like, heavily produced i mean i found i found with your album you know it's kind of a it's like a nice middle ground you know it's it's got this modern feel but it's it's not overproduced it hasn't you know it hasn't got this kind of uh 
I don't know what it is. This kind of fakeness, I, I maybe from what everything that's been put on it. Um, but it, yeah, it's just if, if it's this nice kind of. I think somewhere in there, there's a middle ground, isn't there? You know, where where you can use the the modern technology, but up up to a certain point. Totally, it's it's a it's it's again like how lucky are we to have these tools? But again, they're tools. Yeah, they're not. We and again, I firmly believe that you know the human is the driver, not mm-hmm. the other way. You know, um, that's just, that's my perspective on it. You know, these are incredibly powerful tools that we get to use in order to enhance or, you know, our, our, what we do as humans. And I think that's amazing. But when it becomes all about the robots, you know, for me, I, I just don't feel the music in the same way. Not all the time. Um, mm-hmm. For my own personal expression, you know, I want to keep, I want to keep some, uh, you know, some, uh, some, some stubble in there. I want to keep a little, uh, you know, a little, a little hair on it. Mm. Um, a question I always like to, to finish on that, ask every guest that, that, that comes on. Um, if you could tour uh, with one, one band or musician from the past and one from the present, who would they be? Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's an incredible. That's a great question. So I am going to, my brain is completely melting right now. I'm I'm shutting. (laughs) Everybody goes, oh my God, because there's so many options. (laughs) So I think, you know, I was just thinking about this artist the other day. I think it would be super fun to tour with Tame Impala. I think I just, you know, I think that's somebody who really, uh, talking about what we've just been talking about, um, embraces some vintage aesthetics, Mm. but with a very, modern approach and very much using those tools with um, such unbelievable melodies, you know, that that a lot of times it's Beatlesque for me. It's like, oh, my gosh, this is so good. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, so so let's say for a modern act, maybe Tame Impala, that would be cool, even though I know we're very different, but I, I really admire what's going on there. Um, and then maybe for a vintage artist, oh boy, I mean, or uh, as maybe transition to the next world. I mean, I mean, let's say Jimi Hendrix, because to stand in the presence of Hendrix uh, or Stevie Ray Vaughan, for that matter, or Jeff Healy, again, if I could just hear Jeff Healy play again uh, in front of me, um, would absolutely, uh, I'd probably catch fire. But, um, but yeah, let's say Hendrix and Stevie. Um, and you know what? I know you said just one, but I was listening to, I was listening to Donnie Hathaway live the other day, um, actually here on, on Dr. Martin Luther King Day, which was Monday here, listening to some live Donnie Hathaway. And I, I think, I don't even, yeah, I, I don't even know what to say other than that's some of the most majestic sounds I've ever heard in my life. Have you ever heard his live, his live albums, Donnie Hathaway? No, I haven't myself. I'll, I'll go and listen oh. to them. Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, that, that, those, I know you said one, but maybe those, no, that's a short answer, but if I keep thinking, I'll keep going. So yeah, I'll, I'll go with I can't imagine what like to see Hendrix, uh, cutting people in half in person. I think it would be, it would be, you know, I think we, I think I'd be concussed from the experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for joining me. And uh, of course, if people want to do to, um, pre-order, you can get the the new album. The walls are coming via the the link in the description below. Um, I believe there's a vinyl as well, isn't there? For that, I mean, we're we're vinyl people here. Oh, I love that. Yeah, we've got some vinyl coming as well. So, mm-hmm. vinyl and goodies, and you know, thanks for uh, thanks for the push on it. You know, yeah, this is a very personal album, and and I think. Uh, yeah, one that I feel I feel really proud of. I'm really grateful to release it, and I'm really thankful to you for having me on today to help uh, help get the word. <laughs> oh, it's cool, man.